Hey everybody, uh, this is John with the Christian Outreach Office, and I'm excited tonight because everyone likes to share things that they love. If you love something, you want other people to know about it, and that's what tonight's about, because I'm going to share with you somebody I love, my friend, uh, Sean Forrest. Sean, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for being a part of this tonight. Happy to be here, John. Nothing I'd rather do than hang out with you, talking to all these amazing people. Does that sound like a game show host almost? Almost, but it's good. I mean, it, it works. It works. You know, you got, you got cheesy poses and, and all that. Hey, for everyone who's come on board, I want to say thank you for coming out tonight and being a part of this webinar. Uh, it is our desire here in the Christian Outreach Office to be able to serve you and to bring you great content to help you grow in your faith all year round, including things like webinars. We have uh, past webinars up on our website if you want to go check those out. We also have some blogs, videos, and other things that will help you grow in your faith because our mission has always been to go rebuild the church in the spirit of St. Francis, who is our patron and our guide. And, uh, you know, we want to help you uh, become all that God intended you to be when he first created you. Now, let's start with a prayer, and uh, then I'll give a, a, a few tips. And we're going to just jump right into it. All right? Let's begin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you and praise you for your love, your goodness, and your mercy. We thank you for being able to uh, celebrate this extraordinary year of mercy where we focus uh, our attention and our prayer on your kindness, your everlasting, never-ending mercy. And Lord, as we experience that mercy, as we come into contact with your grace and who you are, we desire that it transform us, that it change us. And therefore, as we move forward, we know that the year of mercy uh, has officially come to an end, but the living out of mercy does not come to an end, ever. Lord, give us the grace to live in your mercy, to seek your mercy, and to show your mercy in real and tangible ways to everyone around us, especially those who are most in need of your mercy. Uh, we thank you, Lord. Uh, and ask that you pray, pray that you have mercy on our country, continue to guide it and lead it. Bless our leaders. Bless all those that uh, serve, uh, especially as we head into uh, Veterans Day, all those who have served in the military all those who've laid down their lives, uh, that we might enjoy the freedoms we do here in America. Bless all, all those that are currently serving as well. And just bless this time, may it be what you want it to be. And we ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. All right. Well, the topic tonight is beyond the year of mercy, uh, loving with a missionary heart. And uh, when I think of missionary heart, I definitely think of my good friend Sean. Uh, he's been, well, we've ministered a lot over the last uh, decade or so, uh, different different circumstances, but I stand in awe of him when I think of where his heart is in terms of ministry and what he does, because he just, I think he, he typifies uh, the generous response that God is looking for from each one of us who uh, call ourselves Catholic Christians. So, um, Sean, why don't you uh, kind of maybe explain a little bit what kind of missionary work you do, uh, how, how you were drawn into that, and uh, and maybe start talking about, you know, what does it mean to have um, a missionary heart, and how can we love with a missionary heart? Awesome. Uh, so the mission is, well, it's to the poorest of the poor. Haiti's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And, you know, the average, you know, People live to be about 53 years older. That's the average lifespan. Um, and in the, lots, in the slum, it's a lot less than that. So it's really, it's a country of about 9 to 10 million people, and it's estimated that 1 million of them are orphans. So it's, it's a pretty tough place. So we have an orphanage. We have a school. We have homes for the elderly. And then we're building a medical clinic now that will be, it's just going to be amazing. It's just still needed and it's going to save so many people's lives and so so we help on that end when we do ministry and we help we help the people who are sick we, we find the orphans the widows and bring them to a place for shelter but we also proclaim the word of god because they need to hear it and they love to hear it and they don't really have many bibles so if they're going to hear the gospel it's usually going to be us from the missionaries going out to them and sometimes they get you know there, there's sometimes voodoo um not when you think of voodoo don't think of like something you know, like chickens on the head and stuff like that. Just like, it's more like a Wicca, like here, Wiccan kind of here, Wiccan light. Um, there's different degrees of it, but that kind of infiltrates into their faith. 
um, because they don't hear the gospel enough. They don't have the scriptures, so we have to go out and share that with them. The other aspect is it's not just about them. It's about bringing people over here and giving them a place to be able to share their faith and grow in faith. And um, it, it's the whole the whole Jesus thing changes when you become a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. Yeah. That's right. I think uh, when we look at what a disciple is, I think the truest sign that we've really reached a level where we're living authentically as disciples is when there is um, missionary impulses, uh, where we feel compelled by what God is doing in us and through us to go forth with the gospel and to do uh, the things that Christ did and, and really imitate them in our lives and you know take on uh, the idea of being a servant first and putting other people before ourselves. Um, for all you all are on board, I want to thank you once again for coming on board. And I want to highlight one thing. On your uh, side of your screen, you see the to webinar control panel. And if you look going down, you'll see like uh, uh, different uh, arrows with words next to them. You'll see one that has uh, questions. Um, if you have that, go ahead and click on that arrow. And in that box, you can type in a question for either myself or Sean, and we'll be happy to answer it. And we're going to start having a conversation. We want to bring you into the conversation by having you ask us questions, and we'll respond to those uh, throughout the, uh, the webinar. Um, yeah, yeah, Sean, I want to sit here and talk to you with more people. Let's do this thing now. Sounds great, but just after a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He'd, he'd much rather talk with you than me. Uh, <laughs> um, so, in all seriousness, though, you know, we, we look at uh, the year of mercy. What, what do you think, uh, Chump, yourself, was the, the most profound impact on your walk with the Lord this past year during the year of mercy? Well, I find that I'm a great proclaimer of God's mercy to everybody but myself. I, I find that. You know, people were like, it's too difficult, God's this. And I'm like, you don't get it. God's crazy about you. And then with myself, I hold myself to that, like, like, I'm like a Pharisee to myself. And I will, in my head, I'll know that God is merciful towards me. But my heart will be like, no, you know, it's so, you've got to do this, you got to do that. And I can easily become works oriented. And stop relying on the mercy of God and, and, and still keep thinking, like, you know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. So it was, I remember I went to confession and uh, I was in Norwich, Connecticut. I went to confession and I just laid a lot of stuff out there. And the priest was like, okay, so say so you're active contrition. I want you to walk through the doors of mercy, receive communion, you know, and, and uh, you know, your sins are forgiven and your purgatory. And, and, and it was just all this mercy. And I'm like, I'm like, I just feel like I need to be like yelled at more or something. And he just laughs and he's like, yeah, he's like, you, you got the wrong faith, man. And we started laughing in the confessional together. And it really felt like, you know, that, that, that's Jesus. It's like, dude, yeah, you're a knucklehead. I died for your sins. You're, you're sorry for them. You hate them. I'm crazy about you. You know, I, I think, I think for me, I, and this isn't new, so I heard this a long time ago when I was about like 16 years old. I heard this preacher preach this. And for me, sometimes I feel like I'm going to get before Jesus and I'm going to be trying to justify myself. I'll be like, yeah, I built an orphanage. I did this and I, I, and I did this. And he's going to be like, shh. And I'm going to be like, no, no, no. And then I did this and this. And he's going to be like, shh, dude, just come here. Just want to hold me first. And I'm going to be like, what? And he's like, yeah, just waiting forever to put my arms out to you. To, you know, just hug you. And let's talk about this after. Um, I, I just so getting the mercy to go from here to here was, was huge for me. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, as I listen to you, I, mean, I, I, I think I've shared our, we've shared different parts of our spiritual journey, and, and I think it's always um, one of those things that Satan goes after each one of us, you know, trying to uh, trick us into believing that maybe our relationship with God the Father is like other human relationships because we live in a very transactional society. You know, what, what are you going to do for me? And I'll quid, quid pro quo. And so we always have this kind of maybe kind of quid pro quo mentality with God. Okay, God, I'm going to come with you to you and I'm going to ask for mercy, but in exchange, I'm going to have to do this, this, and this. It's not going to be free. I know that nothing, nothing is, 
and, and life is free. And, and when you come to mercy, you're embracing the ultimate reality that simply put is too good to be true, but completely true. Right. You know, it, it's kind of hard too when you're, I have to be careful I say this because I haven't really thought about that much the same thing to me. It's, when you're a speaker, like, I hope this comes out right. If it doesn't, it's just your, it's your ears that are messed up, not my voice. Um, I find that people put this level of you have to be a certain way, a certain holiness, or this or that, and, and it kind of makes you think, like, oh, my gosh, I've got to be perfect all the time. And if you're not, you know, like, well, oh, people will be scandalized if I sin, and I'm like, darn. It, it, after a while, it just it, it, it can build up, and, you, you know, it's like, Jesus came to set us free and take our burdens off, but it's easy sometimes because, you know, you hear the hype and then you start believing the hype and then you're like, oh, you know, I, I've got to be perfect. And you start building this stuff on your shoulders and then you crash into sin. So it's like this horrible thing of like, well, I've got to be perfect, which causes anxiety, which causes stress, which leads to sin and fear. Yeah, now, that's, it's really true, you know, to, to stand up for Christ and say that you're going to try to do something. You know, I mean, a lot of people have faith. Um, to take it outside yourself is a risk. You risk rejection. You reject. You 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 you, 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 you run the risk of, of of trying to be like Christ and failing. But when we it, once again it touches upon the central reality of mercy, right? You know, like it is ours in Christ, and because we're loved so perfectly, you know, we should not be afraid. And fear, the only, the only thing greater than fear, and fear is a very, very powerful emotion, is the freeing uh, experience of, of Christ's love. And you know, perfect love drives out all fear. And I think, you know, we're, free, we're afraid of failure, we're afraid of projection, we're afraid of, you know, saying one thing and, um, you know, doing another and finding, you know, that, that, that yeah, Satan can get in our heads and, and twist it all around so that, you know, you're right. We're, we can't find peace. So, what, 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 can you talk about maybe what happened? It, you know, this this year as you went through this year, how did you find that peace? You know, were there, were there anything uh, in particular that that helps you uh, work through that? You no, know, I, I would say I go like this: I have peace. I don't have peace. I have peace. I don't have peace. And and this is going to sound weird. I've come to have peace about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be perfect. And I, and I honestly, it wasn't a moment as much as really just to keep going. Right. To keep going to the sacraments and just keep trudging on. Because I'm, I think I'm different than a lot of people as far as, you know, like I'll go to the student book conferences and I'll see people falling in the spirit and everywhere and they have this emotional. And I, I rarely have an emotional or uh, an ecstasy with the Lord or something like that. I, I, I had one moment encounter with the Holy Spirit that was supernatural. I was 12 years old. Since then, I encountered the Lord through the poor, through the smile of a little girl, or, uh, you know, who just received her first gift ever in her life. Right. And uh, I truly do encounter Christ. Um, now, there's, there's a great Stephen Curtis Chapman song. And for those of you who don't know Stephen Curtis Chapman, you've got to get his stuff because he's one of the greatest ever. Because he's not afraid to say the name of Jesus in the songs like some people are not judging. I guess I could judge. You're at mercy. I just ruined the whole thing. Shut it off. Everybody just shut it off. Don't look at me. I'm hideous. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what I thought. Oh, okay. That's not important. But, but in this song, he says, you know, um, I saw the face of Jesus in a little orphan girl. She was standing in the corner on the other side of the road, uh, on the other side of the world. Um, and he says, you know, basically like you were looking for Jesus. Now you found me. What now? What will you do with this treasure you found? Right. So through my own family and um, developing an incredible sense of gratefulness for everything around me, I've really been able to see God's mercy. Um, just re every day, like out loud saying, God, thank you for this. Thank you for that. Thank you for this. Uh, I, I tell the kids when I speak to them, um, that when you're not saying thank you to God for the little things, you just become rotten. You really become spoiled. And, and when the troubles come, you, that's all you've been focusing on your whole life. So they, they, they seem, God doesn't do anything for me. I'm like, you're alive. 
That's one thing. You're alive, you know? And in America, you know, I remember having one guy say, well, I'm alive, man, but I suffer. And I'm like, but you suffer in America. It's different. Right. Um, it's not like suffering in Haiti. You can get pain meds. Uh, right. they can't, you, know, you, you can lay on a bed. There's a soup kitchen. There's something. So when you can look and go, all right, man, this is, this is a bummer, but boy, there are people worse off than I am. That's, that's really growing in holiness and just gratefulness of God of like, well, this stinks, but you know what? I have cancer. This stinks, but I can get chemo here. I can go to a doctor. There's hope. So it's really, it's really that thankfulness in every little thing. And I, man, I have to practice at that. Um, sometimes I just get working so much that I work, 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 and then I start hitting brick walls, and I'm like, wait a second. I can't believe I'm even a part of this mission. Thank you, God. I'm so glad that I just got sick. Um, because, wow, because I got sick doing, helping the poor. Who gets to do that? Thank you, God. Right. Um, I don't always do that perfectly, John. Sure, sure. No, I, I hear what you're saying, John. And, and um, Rob, uh, Thank you for your comment. He said, in this year of mercy, we, we have committed to weekly adoration. And, uh, you know, and, I, and I, wanna, I wanna talk about that because the connection between what he's saying and what you're saying is absolutely true. You know, Mother Teresa used to tell her, as part of their discipline with, uh, with her sisters in Calcutta, they used to have to spend two hours a day in adoration. And the reason she had her sisters do that is she said to, to them, simply put, if you can't recognize Jesus in the Eucharist, you're not going to recognize Jesus in the poor. And if you can't see Jesus in the poor, you're going to lose your heart to do this ministry. You know, having a having a missionary heart and living the year of mercy is not about making a list of things that you must do to be merciful. I got to do this check, this check. It is really entering into this surrender to God where you say, God, you take my heart. You take my heart with all its brokenness, with all its selfishness, with all its faults, with all its wrinkles. Take my heart and transform it and make it like yours. Give me your eyes so that when I see somebody, I'm not repulsed, but drawn into to, 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 to compassion. And if, if called by the Spirit, to act upon that compassion, that I would see people, and I mean truly see people, uh, I was out walking the other morning at, uh, you know, six in the morning. And uh, was, normally when I walk, there's nobody else on the street. And this particular morning, there was another guy walking towards me. He was carrying a couple of grocery bags. So imagine I didn't get up early. Maybe he was bringing home breakfast food for his kids or something. Didn't look like he had a lot of money. He didn't look like, like, he just didn't look like anybody cared about him. And so as I got closer to him, you know, as I saw him in the distance, I took my headphones out. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to make human contact here, you know, and, uh, you know, he was, he was looking at the, looking at the speed as he walked. He didn't want to look up, but when he got about 20 feet away, I said, hey, so glad to see another person out here this morning. How are you doing? And I mean, like immediately, his posture, like he straightened up and he got this big grin on his face. That's awesome. <laughs> he said, I'm doing great. How are you doing? You know, I was like, I think he was expecting me to be like everyone else he was in the world. It's like, okay, this is, I don't want to make awkward contact with somebody I don't know. And, I, and, and what if they want to hurt me? And oh my God, you know, like we, we let fear lock our hearts. And I'm like, mercy and fear are on opposite ends of the extreme. You know, and that's just one little story. I'm not, that's not going to make me a saint, but it, it's a constant, uh, you know, in the little things where you can show mercy, then I think when it comes to the big things, you're going to have work towards those big things. So I, I might make, you know, living in your mercy is just letting Jesus work um, uh, in your heart and then moving forward uh, into deeper expressions and deeper reception of mercy. You know? Yeah. I was, I mean, first of all, you know this already, but those little those little acts of great love do will make somebody a saint. You know, because not everybody can go to a third world country, but you can sit with a kid you'll be able to sit with um, you know, I, I love, you know, I, I always tell my kids, don't walk too long down the street with your earbuds in and, and your sunglasses on looking down because that's not an inviting person that's going to lead people to Christ. You're in a bubble. See, what's cool is you're listening, of course, probably praying, then also you see somebody, boom, you pop them out so that this person is more important than that song at that moment to you, another human being. All right. 
And that, that's just so beautiful. And, um, and the mercy, like, not just for me to receive God's mercy, but what you're saying earlier, it's like, God, help me be able to give that mercy to other people. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, this probably isn't true, but it's not a profound, profound last night, but all these people who are freaked out, like, oh, but, oh you know, Hillary's going to destroy the country, or Trump's going to destroy the country, and I'm like, I, I think Catholic, the Catholics that gossip destroy the country more than those two will. Mm. I, you know, I think, I think, Somebody who goes to church but never even says hi to somebody who's new or leaves or welcome or doesn't have a welcoming or merciful heart of like, Lord, I want to know you. I, I think that's a destructive force in itself. Um, you know, so we're worried about all these things in the world, and it's like, what about our own hearts, our own souls? Are we, because you know, truly Christ is, you know, he's king. Whoever's president, Christ is king. We've, we've been seeing that all on the internet. But it's like, do we really believe that? Do we live that? Do we want people to know that? Are we... Uh, are we merciful to other people? It's not just like, God, you know, forgive me for my sins. It's like, oh, yeah, i got to forgive other people as you forgive me. Oh, man, that's the hard part. Right. You know, and, and, and we had a great comment and a question um, from uh, one of our participants named uh, Mary Ann, and she said, what are some tips to use when on Facebook that can help us be merciful in our written words, right? So easy to fall into the trap of lashing out and being arrogant. Um, I'm going to let you... I want to say one short thing, and I'm going to let you uh, speak to this as well, Sean. For me, I think you know the, the key is when you go on, um, you know, any kind of social media, post, tweet, whatever. Um, do it for one 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 person audience, and that's Jesus Christ. Mm. You know, write it like Jesus is the only person who's going to write it. Right. There's only there's the only person who's going to read what you write. So. You want to make, if that's your attitude, like I'm not writing, you know, I'm not going to go out there to try to win arguments. I'm going to go out there to be Christ and to reflect Christ. And when we, you know, that's the trap of social media. And you talk about, you know, take your earbuds off, your sunglasses off, saying that to your children. That's great advice. I mean, put down the phone, too. You know, like, if you go into any public place nowadays, you'll see 10 people, quote, unquote, having dinner together, and they're all, you know, like... You know, they're not like they're not they're not interacting. But if this if this if this type of communication it affects our human relationships. Well, you know, and, and the church says that we're supposed to always read things with with charity and always presuming they mean the best thing by it. Because I have seen so many fights and things, because you can't put your emotions well in like what you mean when you write things. Um, when, when, you put, when you put a text up or you write something, uh, somebody can take it and look, oh, he meant this. And, and, and no, I didn't mean that at all. So we always want to presume when the person writes something um, that they're writing with the best intention instead of always like going, they meant this. It's like, wait, stop. Could they have meant this? Okay, let's presume on that until we get further evidence of that. You know, it's just, this kind of communication is brutal. Uh, it, it, it wrecks friendships, it hurts people, um, just because you can't, you know, the theology of the body, the person's not there. It's, it's just the writing. And so you're constructing this person through your own wounds while you're reading what they're writing. And they might say something that triggers an old wound from you, and they didn't mean it at all, but you jump all over them out of a fear or a wound because the person's not there. So it is it can be a pretty sketchy way to communicate. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, social media, uh, social media, and uh, being able to be able to go out there and go out there. A positive force. A positive force. Um, yeah. We had another, uh, yeah. another uh, comment here. Uh, comment here uh, what we see in parallels with my prayer, that will be done, not my will, but yours. And, uh, and it was uh, Catherine who shared that. And Catherine, that is a beautiful prayer. You know, for me, be, receiving mercy and being merciful. And overcoming my own, my own self-righteous tendencies, my own resistance to come out of myself. Um, you know, it's it's never been, I guess, never been easy. I've always had to make a deliberate act of the will. But when I pray for that grace, I always pray that prayer because you know, never go to the Lord and say, God, I will do this for you. I will be more merciful because the reality is, we. We don't want to do what we will. We want to do what he wills. 
And don't go to war and say, you know, Lord, let me tell you what I can do. You know, because we can't always do what God wants to do. There is a stretching that comes with saying, Lord, not my will, but yours. Because if he's going to call us out of ourselves, if he's going to say, look, this year of mercy is ended, but we need apostles of mercy to be walking this planet 24-7, then I guarantee you that the grace to, to fulfill that impulse, that desire that might be welling up in your heart, is there, but we have to be asking for it. Give us this day our daily bread. Give, it, give me what I need this day to be able to love and forgive the way you want to. And, 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 if, and if you can't find it in yourself, then make that your honest prayer. I can't do this, Lord. I'm incapable of forgiving in this situation. I'm incapable of loving in this situation. But I know, Lord, that through your grace, it will happen through me and as you work in me. And I think so many times, you know, wow, we, we can be so, you know, we, we, we think we're at what we're capable of. We, we totally misread ourselves, and, and the Holy Spirit can guide us to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I speak to so many young men who struggle on the internet, obviously, pornography, all those things, and, and some of them are like, I will never be able to break this. I will, you know, I, and, and they start to go into despair, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of trusting in the mercy of the Lord, of like, you know, the, the, that addiction is not who you are. That's what you're unfortunately caught into. But that doesn't diminish God's love for you in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and God's merciful. He loves you, and he, he and He sees the battle, and that battle is sharpening you in other areas of your life that you're even that God will even use that to help make you a saint. Yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, in showing mercy to yourself. I think the thing to remember is. Our frailty as humans, our frailty in our relationship with Christ is in a real way a grace because it makes us more reliant upon him. I think if we could do this Christianity thing all the time perfectly, we would never learn the true essence, the crowning glory of God, which is his mercy, because we wouldn't need it. You know, we would not experience the mercy of God, unless we sin. And we, we celebrate that during the tribunal when we sing, oh, happy fall, that one is such a great Savior. But it, it needs to be a reality that we not forget. Because we only pray that prayer once a year, but it's a reality, 365, right? We are blessed to know the mercy of God. And, and, and when God shows mercy, he is showing the completeness of who he is. He, he is totally uh, justifying us through his divine gift of grace. And it's not a contradiction to say God is just and God is merciful because the mercy of God justifies God because it, may, it means when he's showing mercy and forgiveness towards us, he's completing the deepest essence of his nature. And yet we still bring to that relationship with the Father past rejections maybe from our own earthly father. That's mm -hmm. That we always had to earn their love that we never had it lavished on us as children. And so uh, as adults, we still live in insecurity of, of, of truly believing there's a secure place of love for us in the arms of God. We still think because everything else in our life seems to have strings attached that when we come to God, we have to find what those strings are. And, and they're not there. We will not find the strings attached with God. And, and, and we, we hear words in, in our youth, uh, we were put down and hurt, rejected, and we we kind of instead of taking that as a as a an incident that we can move through, those wounds become an identifying marker on us, and that makes it hard to show mercy because we've not let God touch with His merciful love those deep wounds and experience the deep healing, so we are free to show it the way He's calling us to. So I, you know, it, it's so key, you know, as we move out of the year of mercy and into you know, the rest of our lives as apostles of mercy, people committed to showing mercy, that we first not be afraid to explore the depths of God's personal um, uh, mercy for us. Amen. Yeah, I, I can't even expound on that. You just nailed it. Well, but, okay, so, so, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the showing of mercy, because Jesus was very clear in the Beatitudes uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
mercy's hard because we're prideful, arrogant, self-centered, broken, wounded. Um, you know, and that's when we and that's when we, we look and, we, and do the whole introspective thing. How how can 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 a person who's like I want to overcome my, my my brokenness, my sin, and become more merciful? What are some practical tips that we can give to people on this webinar of breaking out of that shell? Because as long as we're trapped there. The world's not going to change. Only God's mercy and love will change this world. You know, it'll make America great again. Not, not, not the Trump church. Okay, so. Man, so what helps me? And because I, I, I fail. Like honestly, for me, it's, it's, it's easier for me to help the poor, the extreme poor, than it is to be merciful to like gossips. I truly struggle with gossips. That's, that's my thing. Um, and what really I helps you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you see what I did there? Is, <laughs> that is funny, man. That's that's not right. That's not right. Uh, so, when I constantly remind myself that that person who's driving me crazy is not holy like me. Uh, when I when I'm reminded that you know they are a human being that are that are going to live forever, that they're you know they have a soul, their body will resurrect, and then that that is a human being that is made in the image and likeness of God that is going to live infinitely. I go wow, okay, a couple of things. That's incredible of the dignity of that person, and secondly is uh, I better get along with them now because I'm going to be with them forever, man. It's we got. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that to me is a huge reminder because we live in this world of like, all right, you know, I don't like that. I'm going to shut it off. I don't like you. I'm going to unfriend you. I don't like this. I'm going to boom, boom. And it's like, wait a second. Fuck. When we die and we're in the presence of God and we're seeing people with the eyes of Christ, that person that you're struggling with here is somebody that you're going to love beyond anything you've ever been in love down here. And you're looking, you're going to look and go, man, was I a stumbling block to that person? Because Satan's the enemy, not that person. So how do, how do I pray for them in that moment? And even, even when you pray for them in that moment and you don't feel any love, that's perfect. That's awesome. You're like, I can't stand this person. I'm just going to will myself to pray for them. Not because I feel love for them, but because Christ loved them first, I'm going to love too. Um, for no other reason than Jesus, you love them. You died for that person. They're they're hopefully going to be with us forever in heaven. We're all going to be with you in heaven. So I'm going. I'm I'm for you, God, for my love of you. I'm going to pray for that person, even if she got to start there. Because of my love for you, I'm going to pray for this person. I'm having a hard time loving them at this moment, but because I love you, I'm going to do it. And I think that can like it it it, it shocks your brain out of doing the circular pattern of like, okay, this person harmed me, I will put up my defenses. I will now attack, I shut them off. And you keep doing this. And then also when you bring the Jesus factor and you go, wait, you love me first because I love you so much, I'm just going to pray for them right now, one Hail Mary. And just kind of break that cycle of that I'm wounded, guard, attack, shut off. Amen. Yeah, and, uh, and, that, and that's part of it is identifying uh, in ourselves what what triggers that defensiveness. You know, you know the uh, the the term mercy comes from the uh, Latin misericordia, which really means to open your heart to the misery of another. When we look at somebody who's sinning against us, you know, the greatest misery is living in sin. And even if you know somebody who's stuck in sin and they're, they're hateful and mean, you, I can guarantee you that that person is living in misery. They are not happy people. Right. And, you know, to, to show mercy is a, is a heart thing because it means that we're willing to open our hearts. And you know what happens when you open your heart? You run the risk of being hurt. I mean, we can all walk around and just say, I'm never going to touch another person and I'm never going to be hurt again. Or we can say, like Jesus, I'm, gonna, I'm all in. I hold nothing back. I open my heart to, to the most miserable in the world, to love. And, and if we really want to get into that movement, the first thing that we have to do is to go to the Lord in prayer and first say, Jesus, I want to be somebody 
who's opened my heart to your, to your mercy. I want you to step into the mess that's me. Because if I don't know, if I don't learn from you how to do that, Jesus, what it feels like to have someone step into my own messiness and love me and embrace me in, in my worst moments, through my worst sins, then how am I going to be able to ever go out of myself to another and do the same thing? And we learn yeah. from Christ through relationship with Christ, through letting Christ touch us. You know, and if you're feeling stuck in showing mercy, the first thing is pursue the mercy of God with reckless abandon. Be somebody whose heart, you know, to, to, to embrace the heart of Christ that's open to your own misery and suffering either through sin or through woundedness, through the sins of others that have been committed towards you, because that's where a lot of the pain starts. We get hurt, and then we don't want to open our hearts, and then we can't either, we can't receive or share mercy when we close off our hearts, because that's what it really is all about. It's, you know, it's a heart thing, you know, you know mercy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, sometimes I will write down, you know, all the things that I, I, I look at where I've been and where I am. And, you know, after, you know, I'm like, I'm 27. So you said, I'm 28, I'm 20 years. Anybody believe in that? No? Okay. So I write down when God's delivered me from things. And, and so I don't forget it. It's, it's easy to also just be in one place and, and not see where you've grown or be thankful for this or that. And, um, and in writing that, it reminds you of like, oh, what a wretch I am. And thank God for God. Um, and the fact that I'm even here is because of you. And, and that kind of boy, that's, that's like a, almost like a litany of, well, well it, 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 it's going to bring some serious humility for you when you kind of go through. And it's, you know, it's like you're supposed to do that when you prep for confession. But also when you just want to give a thank you to God, opening your prayer and praise and worship God just for a little bit. God, thank you for this. Thank you for delivering me from this, man. Thank you. Thank you for that. Or when I was doing this when I was younger and thank you for your mercy in that. It just, for me, it reminds me of where I've been, where I'm going and, and that uh, God's been there the whole time. So right. make sure that when you're getting, it's easy to beat yourself up, but you know, don't be afraid to see that tiny little bit of, of walk further down the path of God. Like even if you thought of praying for somebody you can't stand and you didn't do it, that's, that's a potential growth there. When you stop for a second, like, I should pray for that, oh, but I'm not. But at least you thought about it. So even, even a little bit. Sure. And, and it's important to remember that, that growing in our understanding of mercy and our deepening of shown mercy is part of what we call ongoing conversion. I think oftentimes we live in a society that, that you know, you can microwave anything in under a minute and it's instantly ready to go. You can turn on the television, watch a 30-minute uh, episode, and it's all wrapped up. Or you get things figured out in under you know, 30 minutes, including eight minutes of commercial. So in 22 minutes, all of life's biggest issues can get resolved. And that's just not life. I mean, we are God's handiwork, right? We are a work in progress. So as you, as, as you start, if you are embracing this call to be more merciful, because there's a number of questions, and I want to turn our attention to those here, Sean, before we run out of time. Like somebody said, showing mercy to others at our job, and, 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 and they live up in Maine. They said that the current culture up there is it's very challenging. Uh, what suggestions do you have to keep going in a difficult, secular culture? And then the follow-up question that she asked was, how can we reach our young people, such as our 13-year-old sons? So um, it's difficult. Yeah, so, you know, and, 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 and it's also, well, let me start with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I go back to the, the, the simple idea that if we say a, a daily yes to the Lord, that's what it takes. A daily yes to being open to his mercy. Uh, to take some time every day, preferably at the end of your day, to look over your day, to see where you've fallen short. And, and just ask for mercy. God, when I had this conversation, I lost my cool. I didn't show mercy. Lord, forgive me. Show me your mercy. Uh, you know, and, and, and ask the Spirit to bring to your mind and your heart in, in a few moments of quiet before you sleep. How did I let God down today? 
and then right away ask for mercy because you will receive it. And it's not, it's like, like for you, Sean, it's not always that mystical, wonderful, warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's a reality that grows in us. Um, the other thing uh, that Rob suggested, you know, going to adoration. I, I recommend adoration for people who struggle in prayer because if you just put yourself in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, amazing things happen. It's Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And if I were to put, take the, 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 the Eucharist out of, out of the tabernacle or out of a monstrance and instead put a radioactive isotope in that monstrance or in that tabernacle and you sat in front of it, you would never feel the radiation penetrating your body. You would never feel uh, yourself getting sicker and sicker and sicker by, from radiation poisoning to way down the road. But it would start, it would be happening beneath the surface on a cellular level, you'd be being transformed. And I'm telling you, the cells, the, our spiritual nature, when we sit before the Blessed Sacrament, even when we don't feel it, slowly but surely, our spiritual nature is being transformed. And it's not, maybe it won't be down the road until we've been in that discipline and been in the presence of the Lord long enough that all of a sudden the true effect of that starts to manifest itself in our lives. But we have to trust in the true presence and we have to trust that Christ will have his way if we give him permission. So, you know, I, I would just say do a daily examine and ask for mercy every day. You know that you need it every day and don't be afraid to go to the Lord. If it's mortal sin that he brings to your heart, then get to confession. Um, and then just the Eucharist. You know, be in the presence of Christ as much as you can, even if it's one extra holy hour a week. Just go to the Lord and just sit there. That will transform you. And that really does a prayer, a prayer life, an active prayer life, and it's hard because I, I I know myself. I can tell when I've been praying, when I've been really praying, when I haven't. You know, it's easy to say, "Well, I pray like when I walk or I pray." It's like to actually sit and be present. My mom, my mom used to say that all the time. I go, I'm, I'm like, "Mom, you pray." She's like, "I pray all the time." I'm like, "No, you worry. Uh, you know, you're worrying." She's like, "Oh, yeah, that's true." You know, I pray in the car, and it's like, "Yeah, that, that's valid," but. That moment you can sit down and reflect, be present with God. Yeah, I, it, it's the praying man who has the peace in his heart. And it's the praying man who, the praying man and the active man of faith that has that joy in their heart too. When you have a joy, you know, it, it, I have disarmed more people on social issues by loving on them greatly than any amount of apologetics would. Mm -hmm. Rarely does anybody get converted, I think. And I'm uh, in the heat, it can happen in the heat of battle of showing your knowledge of this and that. But when you bring them fishing, and you're like, you know, what? I just, I just want to, I just want to love on this person first. And your yeah. goal is to love them, not to convert them, not to win an argument. That, that's that's where the fruit. And, and and a joyful person, it's really hard to not like someone who's just laughing, or you know, because you're like, you know what. Jesus died, he rose, I love him, receive the sacraments. I'm like, there's there is no death. That's been conquered. Wow, like, all right. God loves, I am loved. This and then all of a sudden you're just like <laughs> and, and getting used to that, you can't always be like that. You know, you're, you're gonna have bad days. But you know who the joyful people are. You know, it's you know I I, I get it. There are some people pious, they walk out of church like that, and I get it the whole time. Um that's great. There's that time for that, but there's also that time, man, just to, uh, to really be friendly and joyful. Because who wants to come to a church and it looks like everybody's just moaning in agony? It's like you know, it's like man, God, Christ is risen, Hallelujah! Let's uh, let's let's tell the world about it. God loves me. I love you. I think it was Saint uh, Teresa of Avila who said, "Lord, save me from the sourpuss saints." Yeah. <laughs> And I love that quote because you know it is you know the the fruit of the spirit work in our in our life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self control. Right. So so if we're in the Lord, you know, and, and in His Spirit, and we're in communion with the Trinity through our active participation, Mass, our reception of the sacraments, through our daily prayer and scripture reading, then there should be the fruit of joy in our lives. And this is why you know somebody said is. Um, is being merciful just being nice, or is it more praying for them or both? Yeah, it's not being nice. You know, being merciful is not about, um, you know, it's not about I forgive and I forget, you know. Um, that's not the movement 
of, uh, uh, you know, or, hey, I'm just going to overlook your faults. You know, being merciful, like I said, is about us opening our hearts to the wretchedness of another. Where it's not just, okay, I still think you're a rat, but I'm going to forget the fact I think that you're a rat and, you know, just walk on by. It is having our hearts change so that we see those who hurt us through the eyes of Christ and are willing to not just in our minds say, oh, you know, I forgive you, but really have a movement of the heart where, you know, we're, we're willing not just to, to, to say words to disarm or say words to kind of gloss over a bad situation, but we're really going to work to restore and love and serve that person and, and, and really put ourselves out for it. You know, and there were a couple of questions, and maybe we can spend just a couple of minutes here, Sean. You know, as, and a couple of people have said this, and so I, I don't want to, 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 to gloss over it. Obviously, one of the toughest places to show, show mercy is in our own families. Yep. Yeah. It's easy, I think, sometimes to show a stranger or someone who's poor. And, you know, our hearts can be moved to compassion for somebody who we just meet, who seems to be down and out. How does our heart continue to be moved with compassion for somebody who over and over and over again has hurt us, let us down, betrayed us, um, has not treated us the way that we think we should be treated, and we're, and we're just, we're dealing with frustration. Maybe even it's taken root to the point where it's bitterness. You know, how can we move out of that uh, and, 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 and really love the, our families and be merciful with our families the way Christ calls us to. Wow, how much time do we have? But uh, I mean, what a yeah, ten seconds. You know, I, I often tell people to explain the Trinity in three words or less. Um, I, I often tell people that exact same thing you're basically saying. Um, people be like, "I want to go to Haiti. I want to go to Haiti. I want to help somebody." And I'm like, um, "Do you hang out with your grandmother? Do you ever call her? Do you write her?" And he's like, well, no, I'm like, then why would you go to Haiti? Um, why? And, and, and because it's easier. And I think that's why Jesus is pretty clear. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? Your mother, your brother, your sister, the person, your, the person across the street, you know? Because it's real easy to hold a little baby in Haiti. And, well, it's not easy. I mean, it takes guts. It's courage to go over there and do that. It's a third world country, you know, and you got to enter in. But holding a baby or a little kid who really can't wound you in any way, shape, or form or somebody that you're visiting on a mission trip for a week really can't wound you because you haven't entered in that level of intimacy with them. There's a safety there of like going, well, I can do that. But when you when you have to love your neighbor, you have to see them the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. And also they know who you are. You know, it's like, you know, a prophet is not without honor except in their hometown, you know. So that's a tough thing too. So keeping ourselves in check of saying like are, are we you know these people keep doing this to me um are we ourselves do we keep doing something to them too do we keep having the same response that circular thing but what helped me um was with my father god just gave me this revelation uh my father had this temper and, and it, it was really it was it was tough it was tough when i was young to be around my dad you know it's pretty pretty intimidating figure as far as um, his temper and things like that. And I used to get so mad and, and I had this hatred that was really, it was really brutal with my father. And then it was weird. I was just in prayer and God gave me just this insight to see him as a 12 year old child. Mm -hmm. Um, and realizing what his father was like to him and, and, and seeing that, you know what, he's, he's a kid. We're all just kids. He's just a bigger kid. We're all just wounded. We're all broken. We all have baggage. And I start to feel, instead of anger, sadness. And that was a key moment in my life when it turned to sadness for him, feeling bad. Um, I was like, wow, you know, yeah, you did have a tough life. And you know what? You are miserable. You really unhappy. You were, at that point, came out to be a phenomenal father as we addressed things together. God really healed that. But at the time, when I started really just trying to look at it with you're, you're not happy, you're really sad, and I started to feel bad. I'm like, this little kid who's, you know, in the eyes of God, he's still a kid. It's really sad and broken. So it really helped me to have more mercy when I looked at, at, at these people who do things as children and not as God. 
So when they do break your heart, it's like, well, yeah, we're human beings. That's going to happen. But that's not God. So see, if you can see people as all of us, as children of God and broken and wounded and trying to get back, that helps. Because sometimes we set this level, too, of like, you know, you have to be perfect for me. Right. And, and that's, that's not possible. But again, to, to that person, who's, if, if you have somebody who's hurting you in the physical, you have to tell somebody and get away, obviously, in that, in that direction. But if you're expecting somebody to fail you, well, then you already know it's going to happen. And so don't be surprised it's going to happen. And just, you know, if, if you can love in that moment of saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to have sadness for you and, and instead of anger. And, and, and it's, it's actually having an internal dialogue with that person and with God and really, like, like getting your brain used to that kind of thinking. I really, I really believe people just are stuck in the same war patterns over and over again. I'm wounded, I'm angry, and boom, that whole thing. It's like, how can you switch that? So for me, it was visualizing somebody, because literally we're all just children before God, and some have just grown up to be bigger and older on earth, but they still carry those wounds, so they're just bigger kids with the same wounds. Yeah, I think what you just shared, Sean, absolutely is a perfect example of kind of what I was trying to get at. You know, when we are when we are focusing on ourselves and our woundedness and, our, and the way people have hurt us, you know, we, we it's like putting on glasses that will cause us to see the world a certain way every time. But when we go to prayer and, and we say, you know, God, help me to see things right. You know, and I don't know how long you prayed for healing in your relationship with your dad, how long you went on with that, but all of a sudden you took a new approach and the spirit kicked in and gave you a vision that basically was the key that unlocked a whole nother chapter in the story. Because we, 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 we like, every, you know, I love the saying that um, every sinner has a future, every saint has a past. Like everyone needed, everyone needs mercy, everyone needs compassion, and yet when we get stuck on this uh, internal dialogue and our preconceived notions, you know, we, we, we can't move off of it. And that's why prayer is essential to this mercy, to, to, to allowing God to touch our heart in a way that moves us out of that space where we're, in, we're, in, we're enslaved to the past or to, or to uh, fixated on our own woundedness to be able to move forward. You know, and, and family, you know, you, you experience the deepest love, but you also experience the deepest hurt because you let these people closest to you. They're the ones that know you better than anybody. They're the ones that you've shared more with than anybody. And, and that intimacy, in that community, the vulnerability it can lead to some deep woundedness. You know, and it, it happens too often than not. So, you know, the, the good news in all this is I believe there's always... Um, you know, there's always this this ability to overcome. We're never without hope. And I think that's, you know, an important part of the takeaways. Keep progressing and don't give up hope. Pray for the grace to forgive and seek forgiveness for yourself. You know, and, and I remember being an early married man and, you know, all of a sudden I was having conflicts with my new bride and I loved her, but I was, you know, I was just like, okay, you weren't supposed to act that way. You weren't supposed to do that. I have the script in my head that I already wrote that this is how you're supposed to act in all situations. I have these expectations and you've already failed me three different ways and, and we've been married, you know, for one day. And I was like, you know, and not that the, those things weren't present as we dated when we were engaged, but I think I think I went into this thinking, okay, I'm going to be able to move in with this person finally and I'm going to be, you know, roommates with my best friend. It's all going to be hunky-dory. And it's like when you get that close, you know, even after you're dating and you finally move in, there's a whole other level of learning to forget and let go. One of the prayers that I think will really help you in showing mercy is to pray the litany of humility. If you struggle with attachment to yourself, your pride, your desires, your woundedness, pray the litany of humility. Pray that you would not be afraid. Pray that you would not be attached to those things. Let them go. And it, and it might take a slow process. You know, like you might have, uh, like Satan might have lots of claws in you, trying to keep you, keeping you held down. And as you pray, one by one, those claws are removed until you feel you're finally free of his grasp completely. And, and, and but don't be afraid of the spiritual progress and, and the spiritual effort it will take to get there. Because if you say yes, God, I want to get there. 
God will give you the grace. The only thing that can hold you back from finding a deeper level of grace and mercy in your life is a refusal to go to God and say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm totally messed up. And I can't get out of this situation without your help. You know, I, I, I sometimes get frustrated that, um, with people when they'll be like, I need help for, uh, you know, uh, my boyfriend, I, my boyfriend is so lost right now. And I'm like, how bad do you, how bad did you really want his conversion? Um, are you willing to pray a rosary every day for him? Well, well, you know, I say Hail Mary and, I, and I'm like going, you've got to want this so much. Like, do you really love the person to the point where you're actually going to pray for them? Are you really looking for their conversion or you just want them to work exactly how you want them to work for you? Um, who are you praying for? Is your prayer actually about you or for them now? Is it so the result will be you're happy because now they're acting the way you want them to? Or is it truly you want them to have a conversion and know Christ? Um, and those are two different things. How, how badly do you want the conversion of that person? Because I, I, there's, a, there's a spiritual laziness as far as uh, a, spirit, a laziness in, in our warfare when we're really trying to bring people closer to Christ. It's like, are you willing to fast for them? Are you, what are you willing to do for this person? What are you willing to give up? And they'll never know. But do, do you really care that they're that they're so far from God? When you won't sacrifice for them, you might be further away from God than they are. So it's just kind of a reality check. Yeah. So with that, um, yeah, I mean, I I can't uh, echo enough. You know, especially the word on fasting. There's a, 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 a just a an incredible thing it happens when we fast for somebody. You know, if you sacrifice, and, and, and I will put it in terms of this, what did Jesus have to go through in order to be able to show us mercy? It was the cross. It right? was the scourging at the pillar. It was the crown of thorns. It was the entire passion. It was being spat upon, having his beard plucked, being punched, being rejected by his closest companions in his deepest hour of need. So if anyone had a, a reason not to, you know, to be out of sorts, and not want to show, show mercy in a moment, it would, have been, it would have been Jesus. But what do we know? We know that when, when, when Peter caught the, the gaze of Christ across the courtyard after he just denied him three times, um, as Pope uh, Francis wrote, it was the gaze of mercy. And that's what moved Peter to tears. He saw in, in Jesus' face the mercy. And that's what allowed Jesus, you know, when, when, when when, when Peter received restoration and forgiveness from Christ later on the beach, you know, he knew that it was going to happen because he saw the face of, of Christ. And if Jesus is willing to go through all that in order to, for me to experience his mercy, what are we willing to go through for our brothers and sisters, our parents, those that we love, in order that our relationship with them might be touched by God's mercy, grace, forgiveness, and restoration? Because if it's the template of Christ, it won't come without sacrifice. It won't come right. without effort, serious effort, and we can't give up. And that's what it means to, to love and be merciful. It means I will do what it takes to, to bring restoration. One of the things that really helped me in, 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 in being um, more compassionate and less stuck on myself was making sure that I also did do a daily exam. Did I say anything to my wife today in a way that would have been condescending, rude, um, would have devalued her in any way. You know? And, 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 and if, if something comes to mind, go to her and say, you know what, I was just thinking about that conversation that early. I was being a jerk. I said this, and it, came, it must have come across just really rude to you. If it hurt you, I apologize. You know, I don't want to hurt you. I want to show you love. And taking, you, know, you, don't, you don't take the moral high ground. You take the humble low road with them. And you show them what humility and seeking, uh, uh, you know, you know, seeking that for people, what that looks like. So, anyway, you know, we're uh, just about out of time. We're matter of fact, we're hitting our deadline. Um, I did want to. I did want to. Before we sign off, I ask everyone give give me about five more minutes because I, you know, a lot of people have said, well, how can we become involved in missions. Uh, where can I do missionary work with this summer with my family? 
you know, how many and I are 50, my kids are 17, 20, and 20, 22. I mean, that's awesome that, that uh, you're thinking of that way. Um, other people would, you know, you know, want to know uh, how do we help out in missionary work if we're not able to travel the country but feel the need to help out. I had a couple of comments like that. And, um, you know, I have been blessed to be able to go down to uh, Haiti with Sean. I'm going back with Sean in March to do a week of mission work. And I can't tell you, you know, I've been on a number of mission trips, but I once lived for a month in the dump of the city of Juarez, Mexico, with the poorest of the poor in Juarez. And we would sit at night enjoying a cool breeze because it was like 107 during the day, and the cool breeze was 78. So that was the low temperature. It felt good. And we would sit on the top of this mission building, and you'd be able to look across the Rio Grande River and see million dollar mansions lining the mountainside overlooking the Rio Grande Valley while these people were living in. Uh, you know, cardboard shacks held together with pallets, but no running water, no electricity. Just, you know, if you were lucky, you had a little propane stove to cook on. Um, and, and I've also, you know, been down and seen the work that Sean's doing in Haiti. So I just want to turn it over to Sean and let Sean talk about his mission for a few minutes. And for those who might feel moved from this, uh, this webinar to, to maybe take action, to do something out of yourself, to show mercy and compassion, um, you know, to, to be able to do that. So take it away, John. Thanks, John. Um, so the organization is called Haiti 180, Haiti 180. And it's, it's really just um, entering in, well, yes, we help the poor, but it's a, I call it an intimate encounter with, with the poor. So it's not like you're just building a house for somebody that you don't need. And I mean, that's a beautiful thing to do, but it's, it's, you're going up and cooking for somebody who hasn't eaten in two days and you're going to sit down, then you're going to share your faith with them. And then you're going to keep visiting them so that when you leave, you're really going to miss them. Um, you, they become family to you, friends, and their, and their faces haunt you in a beautiful way. Uh, so that you can't forget them. So it wasn't like a vacation where you meet some people, you forgot about them, but you go, look at this person who inspired me because they didn't have shoes, they hadn't eaten in two days, and they prayed over me. Um, so, you know, I, I truly believe people want to do good things, but they just don't know where or how. And the beautiful thing with this is, well, where is with us, Haiti 180, and how? Just go to our website, and you'll see a link that says go. And that's for anybody who wants to go on a mission and explains you exactly how to do it. And uh, so you, you come over, you really encounter the poor, and they bless you. But also we do ones where, you know, where John and I are going over where you come over, but it's also a training trip for you because we're going to teach you um, leadership skills and things like that. And it's a really cool way to jumpstart, I don't know, your faith. If it's been stagnant or you're on fire and like, I don't know what to do with this fire. I don't know where to go with it. We'll come over. And let these people inspire you, and, and God's going to bless you, too, for going over. Uh, you know, James 1, verse 27, it says, Pure, undefiled religion is this, to care for the widows and the orphans in their affliction, and keep yourself unstained from this world. So it's like, we got to get rid of sin in our lives, because it's about us getting into heaven, right? we got to get into heaven get in, in, and keep going in holiness. And while doing that, encountering the poor, and uh, I, I often say this, I truly believe, God sees your hands much better when you praise and worship when they're dirty, when, when they've been beat up and they're calloused and when you got snot on them from holding a little kid or, or, or you just beat up from building somebody's home or kid, you know. Holiness usually, and I'm not saying always, usually doesn't look like ripped physique. It's your shoulders start to hurt because you're bent over serving all the time. You're in the sun a lot. And your skin gets dried up and you start to age and you look like Mother Teresa. That's usually what holiness will end up. I begin to look more and more like Mother Teresa without the holiness, unfortunately. Um, so <laughs> I, I shrank 12 inches this year, man. It's crazy. Um, and another way, man, if I can do that, if I can plug this, is you know we have a we have a something called Team 180. Um, it's for people who really want to be invested in building a relationship with us. And this is going to sound like an ask. And it is. It's, um, I'm asking people to give $15 a month 
and it's it's three seventy five a week for you adults. That's a beer. Um, for those of you who are more sophisticated, that's a wine. For you youth, that's a coffee. Um, not too young. You shouldn't drink coffee when you're too young. But that donation is huge for us, and it's not a lot of money, and it's 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 a good thing to invest in because it really goes to help the people, and. You know, you really see, you, this sounds so, this, I hate this part, it sounds like commercial. You get my book, I start doing webinars like this. But what I'm trying to do, if, if you join this, what I'm trying to do is build a relationship with you so that eventually, maybe not this year, next year, next, but you're going to come all over on Machine with us. Because it, it is something powerful to go to a third world country and because you see gratefulness on a whole new level. It's it's unbelievable. And when you pray with people in a third world country who who had an earthquake kill 250,000 people in 15 seconds and then hurricanes and they're hungry and then you watch them praising and they have tears in their eyes of authentic love of Jesus Christ. You, you just, you go, who's helping who here? So it, it's like, I'm here for you. Yeah, we got food coming for you and everything. But man, I have learned so much from who you are as a people. It's absolutely incredible. So if you can support us by being a part of it, come on mission with us. Um, join Team 180. It's it's not a big hit, but man, we can use it. You know, we're a grassroots organization that's very faithful to the church, and so it's not just feeding the hungry, but it's also feeding the Word of God. And the bishop there loves us because he says, you, you guys know that man does not live by bread alone. So if you give them food, but you're not giving them Jesus, they're still starving, and they get that. So that's what we're about, and it is an adventure, man. And you've got to take your faith on an adventure. You can't, it goes by too quickly. I can't believe I am 49, man. My life's, I'm two-thirds over in my life. I'm two-thirds over. It's crazy, dude. And it's like... Oh, there wouldn't be any math on this webinar, Sean. Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, but faith, faith without works is dead. And remember, youth group isn't works. Um... Um, going to conferences isn't works. That's receive, receive. We receive confirmation, we receive baptism, we receive conferences, we receive songs, and it's like, at what point do you start to give? And give till it hurts. Uh, not just out of the change in your pocket, um, and not just out of like five minutes of your time, but you say, I've got to quit my sports here because I haven't done anything to help the poor. That's giving. That's radical living. That's that's Jesus stuff right there when you're like, you know what? I love these sports, but man, I could go on mission. I could be helping. I could start a whole program that allows teens to go visit the elderly in nursing homes, and I'll direct this whole thing. That's the greater part um, because giving has to hurt in some way when you know because it's like, wow, that's a lot, but it's that extra gift. And I'm not just talking monetarily. It's like, all right, I'm afraid of flying. I'm afraid of bug. I'm going to go to Haiti. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to Jamaica. I'm going to go to these different places and step out with faith. Because how much? How can you know how much faith you have unless you step out in faith? You could be one of these people like, I think I have the faith. I'd like to believe I would do this. I think I could do that. And it's like, last thing, a lot of people are like, I don't feel Christ. I don't, I don't feel God. And I always say, if you want to feel the comfort of God, first you must get uncomfortable. We are way too comfortable here in America, and it's very difficult to feel the presence of God when, um, well, you, you 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 have the internet. Why do you need God? It can solve all your problems. Um, you have to get, we have to suffer. If we want to know Christ, we have to suffer for the sake of righteousness and suffer for the sake of God's poor. If we truly want to grow in relationship with God, that opens up. Uh, your Easter will be incredible because you'll know suffering at a deeper level. And people who suffer, I truly believe, have a more intimate relationship with our Lord. Sean, thank you. <clears throat> I know your humility and I know how hard it is for you to, to do the ask. Um, St. Francis is my uh, is, is my role model in the sense that you know, he came from a very wealthy background, but ended up giving it all away and then begging in the streets for those who couldn't take care of themselves. And so I will I will only add this. Um, when Sean and I kicked around this idea of starting the, uh, the, the Team 180, you know, I, I, I saw the potential to, to, to raise up an army of people who would be moved in their heart to say, we believe that what you're doing now, Mary, is, is saving lives, and he is. 
to take a baby that would otherwise die of starvation or disease in the slums of Port-au-Prince. When I went down there the first time, it was right after the hurricanes. It was actually a couple of months, or after the earthquake. It was a couple of months uh, after the first hurricane that went through. And there was literally, around the slums, is, a, is a, a trench maybe 20, 30 feet deep. And that's their bathroom. They go down there use the bathroom. Right? At this particular time, everything that had been wiped out had been pushed into this trench. It was overflowing with garbage. It was overflowing with human waste. As we drove through that neighborhood, we had to, to get out of town. I can't describe how overwhelmingly disgusting the stench was. And yet, right next to these piles of filth and trash were people sitting on little pieces of cardboard trying to sell fruit that they picked off a tree up in the mountains and brought down because they knew if they didn't sell this and make money, they would die. There were people wandering aimlessly looking for something and, then, and, and not knowing where they would find it, food, care, shelter. And, 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 and people die by the hundreds in the slums of Port-au-Prince every day. And this, this, this ministry is not about patting ourselves on the back and saying, look at the great stuff we're doing. It is about taking people literally out of hell and giving them a shot at not just having a decent life here on earth, but eternal life with Christ forever. Amen. And I passionately implore you in Christ, if you have the, the means and you are moved, to go to Haiti 180 and sign up for Team 180. Join us in our efforts to save the people of Haiti. Go on a mission trip. It will change your life in a way that nothing else can. Because Sean nailed it. We are so insulated against anything that rubs us the wrong way. We run from pain. And yet Christ ran to the cross. He ran to his pain knowing that it would redeem the world. You run to, to the challenge and, 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 the, and, the, and the work and the suffering that it is to be a mission, missionary, even if it's just for one week, and you will get closer to Christ because where there's suffering, there's Christ. Where there's the poor, there's Christ. You want to know where Christ is? In a special, he makes himself abundantly present to these people out of his great compassion and mercy. And when we go there, and I love this saying, and I think it was St. Vincent de Paul that said this, the poor exist to save us. We don't save them. The poor exist that we might be saved. We need this for our own salvation, brothers and sisters. So if you've moved at all and you want to look for what the next step is, go to Haiti180.com. Find out everything that's going on. Find out how you can get involved. Find out how to support Sean and what the, what's happening down there in Haiti. Um, I, I love this dear man. He has he has suffered greatly for the gospel in a way that not a lot of people I know have. And out of that, I have just a, a profound respect and love for everything he does and would love to be able to see as many of you as possible come on as partners uh, with me. Um, you know, in, in supporting this this mission through prayer, through financing, and, and coming down there and giving up your time uh, and being blessed. I can't wait to go back. I'm honestly, I'm like, I know there's there's that part of me is like, oh god, I, I love a hot shower. I love my own bed. I love rolling out of my bed and walking ten feet to my hot shower. I mean, like, I like, I mean, like. The first time I went down there, I had to poop over a pipe in the ground. And when I went to look at the first time, car cartridges were crawling out. And I'm like, he's fixing up. Like, you're not going to have to go through that. Okay. It's a lot of oh, no, you know, the like, room, that was different now. But yeah. that, those were the whole. No, right. that, that was Don't the like, most disconcerting experience I've ever had in my life, brother. But man, I mean, like, coming back, I still feel the blessing of, of that sacrifice in my life and how it's moved me to a deeper. Um, willingness to give of myself more, because it's it's addictive when you when you experience that rush that rush of the spirit when you move in a missionary mode and and, and I could go on and on. I know you guys have stayed on longer than you thought. I'm gonna wrap it up here. Sean, do you have any final thoughts before I close this in prayer? Just that last thing you said is perfect. <laughs> it's different. I don't mean to insult any soldiers, but like soldiers, brothers in arms, you go into battle. It, in a different way, it's like that when you're on a mission trip with people. Because when you're like, if you get there and it's a drought, it hasn't rained for seven days, 
Kim, when we first went, you're, there's no water to bathe in, and everybody stinks. All of a sudden, there's a thunderstorm, and everybody runs underneath the huts, and it's all poured down, and we're taking showers in our clothes just to get any water. And you know what? You got this one life to have this incredible story, and great stories are rarely written by people who, who don't go on an adventure. And there is an adventure out there. Following Jesus Christ is just, it's, it's, it's a radical thing. It's not a comfortable thing. And at the end of your life, what a story to tell when you follow Christ. So, um, yeah, go for it. Amen. Um, so in, in wrapping up, thank you for being part of this webinar. I hope uh, what uh, I was able to share. I know that there are some particular questions people had about mission trips and what they're like. And, you know, I think we have someone who... Uh, uh, is uh, has some uh, medical experience that's interested in, in what uh, you're doing down there, Sean. Go to his website. We'll find the contact for Sean. To, you know, um, for for those you know who aren't in a position to help financially right now, please pray um, that we get a solid donor base because the the, the goal is after this mission is uh, up and running is to move to the next section of the country where there's nothing and build another one. And then, you know, it's, it's, if I can throw this out too, it's like, it, it, you know, I can just throw this out. Like, we're 15 bucks a month. Like, I watch people line up and pay six bucks for coffee. And I'm like, remember that whole thing about sacrifice? It's like, you know, just buy some instant coffee. doesn't taste as good, but actually it'll taste a lot better knowing that you didn't go give it to the mermaid and that you gave it to the poor person. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to say any product line out there, but it's, it, no Wait, coffee taste. Does it, does, it rhyme, does it rhyme with car trucks? <laughs> Oops, did I say too much? <laughs> All righty. Yeah, so look, start and, and let's, let's be completely honest. Uh, 15 bucks a month is not a sacrifice for most of us. And I'll end it with that. You know, we're not trying to guilt you. I'd rather have you do this because the Spirit of God is moving you to do that. You can look at that face. Come on, I mean, how pathetic Sean looks. Help him. Just, just pray and, and ask God what He wants you to do, and, uh, and 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 say generously yes to whatever comes out of that prayer. All right. And so let's close this whole thing with prayer. See, if we can all get on with our uh, our evenings. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for my brother Sean and the work that he's doing. I thank you for the year of mercy. I thank you for the mercy you've shown me in my life. I thank you for the opportunities you've given me to show mercy. I thank you for the way that that growth has stretched me and at times broken me. I thank you for the way Lord, that you've never given up on me. Through this all, you have taught me your mercy and you have taught me how to be merciful. But I ask God that you expand my capacity both to receive and to show mercy to this world. Lord, let me not think of myself. Let me not think of myself. Not, let me not think less of myself, but let me think of myself less so that I can be focused on, on those around me, those who need my love, especially those within my own family. Bless everyone who's been on this webinar. Bless everyone who's wanted to be on this webinar and can make it. We trust in you, Jesus. We trust in your goodness. We trust in your... Uh, your uh, continued mercy, your continued guidance. And we turn to you, Mary, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope, that you would pray for us, that you would draw us close to that Jesus' heart of mercy through your immaculate heart as we pray again. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of Mercy, pray for us. May the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. This webinar has been recorded. It will be up on our website in a few days. So if you know anyone else you think would be blessed by this message, feel free to direct them to our website. We'll send them out an email when it's good to go. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, guys. We love you. We'll see you again. Thank you all. God bless. Thanks, John. Thanks, Sean. Bye, everybody.